we will have our presenters present, stop share, and then we'll have a Q&A session after that. So starting with, um, starting with Dave. I'm very happy, first of all, to be here and to be part of this, uh, this activity. Um, uh, as I'm sure the introduction said, I serve as chair of the Gear Association. Um, Gear has been around for about 20 years and um, it has been funded by NSF. And the focus of Gear is to coordinate um, uh, responses, uh, reconnaissance missions, following both national and international disasters. Uh, when we started 20 years ago, the focus was on earthquakes. And so our acronym GEAR stood for Geotechnical Earthquake Engineering Reconnaissance Association. However, about 10 years ago, uh, that mandate was broadened to include other events that didn't had a geo component. And by then we had a lot of um, recognition of the acronym GEAR. And so we didn't want to lose that. So we decided to change it to the Geotechnical Extreme Events Reconnaissance Association. So, um, and our mandate has been much broader. Over that 20 year period, we've responded to about 70 events worldwide, maybe even closer to 80 now. Um, and those have included earthquakes, uh, landslides, um, uh, certainly associated events to, to other disasters like uh, tsunami. Um, and then one of the nice things about it is even though our focus as an organization is on the geotechnical aspects, quite often we collaborate with other groups um, where there's interest. Uh, sometimes we, we have social sciences embedded on our team, some we have structural engineers, uh, and in other cases more recently now that other EERs have, are being funded by NSF, we've actually fielded joint teams. And you actually heard about one of those today, the IDA team um, that Jasmine was part of, and that was a joint uh, near gear uh, effort. So uh, maybe the one last thing I'll quickly say is that our focus is very much on collecting perishable data. And you've heard some wonderful examples today about reconnaissance that was done. But you've also heard a few cases where people said, boy, we wish we had maybe gathered a little more data, whatever. Um, since the outset, we've always sort of tried to take the focus that um, it's most important that we collect perishable data, because otherwise any subsequent analysis that we perform is likely to be limited by the fact that we have data gaps or uncertainty in the data. The other thing that I will say is, and everybody who's been involved with GEAR knows that um, we almost um, to a fanatical level require every piece of information to be associated with a lat long. Um, and that way we can locate it at any time later. Uh, we can drop it into Google Earth. We can do whatever we want but knowing where it is, because if you have a great picture, but you're not actually sure where it is other than somewhere in Germany, that diminishes dramatically the value of the data. So I think maybe I'll stop there for now. I know there are a bunch of questions that'll probably cover everything else. Yes, thank you, David, for that introduction. And um, doesn't have to be a, a long introduction. Mostly this is just to explain what the facilities are, the ear, uh, groups uh, and their responsibilities and things that they cover. But if you have something more to present, feel free. Um, I guess uh, Britt is next. Hi, everybody. And again, thank you very much for having us here. It was really interesting to hear the student presentations too. So as David said, the um, work that Jasmine talked about was joint, near and gear. And the focus of NEAR within this is really on coastal storms. We're narrow focus as far as what types of hazards, but then a broad focus as far as what types of data we're looking for. 
So our goal of NEAR is to bring together researchers across a wide range of disciplines, um, academic and also applied or agency researchers to try and understand the response of what we call the nearshore system. And that can include the ocean, the estuaries, rivers, the land, the hydro, hydro uh, geology, the aquifer, and the atmospheric processes, also structures and people's reactions um, to the disaster and how they behave with the disaster um, during a coastal storm. So the other thing I think that distinguishes near is that a priority for us is to try and collect observations pre-event and during the event. So coastal storms are one of the natural hazards that one of the few that are at least somewhat forecastable and predictable. So we typically have warning of at least several days. So a focus of near is to try and get out before the storm makes landfall, do site characterization, know what the conditions were um, as a baseline and also deploy instruments. So for instance, we can understand how the ground becomes saturated as there becomes overtopping or rainfall, how that saturation is affecting the processes and what the perishable data is that occurs during a storm because the coast gets changed by that event. So without making measurements during it, it's really hard to know how it changes during the event itself, as well as doing the post-event reconnaissance. So I think that's one of the, or a couple of the things that sort of distinguish near from some of the other um, reconnaissance groups. And I'm gonna pass it on to Tracy, because again, I'm thinking that most of the questions are gonna address a lot of the other differences in. Um, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Thank you, Britt, thank you. Tracy? Sounds good. Um, I will I will share um, a couple slides real quick um, that I have just to give you an orientation. So this is what I'm calling a quick introduction to STEER. Um, just so you kind of understand what STEER does and does not do. Um, our job is to focus on creating standards for how to collect data and protocol for how to collect data. So building capacity around that, coordinating the response to these events among the deploying uh, personnel so that we can be efficient. And then really trying to find very new ways for people to start collaborating, especially in these um, dynamic teams that we spin up, but also in the translation of the learning afterward. Um, as the student talks already highlighted, a big part of what we do, it's not that we're going in with a hypothesis in our missions. We actually are, are we have protocols to generate large samples of data that are communal and made available right away to inform follow on research by others and to synthesize it to move it quickly back to emergency managers, um, code officials, things of that nature. Um, we work on all the hazards that create loads on structures, dynamic loads. Um, and so those are kind of the, the four big ones shown there by the icons. In terms of our existence, we are the babies relative to gear. Um, other than piloting in 2017 for that historic hurricane season, we weren't spun up to even a prototype until 2018. And we had kind of three years to build the organization. We were responding during that time. And in 2021, we got our full funding to run as a, a fully fledged operation. So that's kind of the chronology of, of our efforts. And you can see the counts here of what we've done to date. Um, and I think probably the coolest part I like is the 29,000 buildings that have been assessed and are freely open for students to analyze and, and work with, including a data set that is now um, being used by the World Bank, USAID, and just won a major award in the UK um, for responding to the Haiti earthquake last August. Um, in terms of our membership, this is, these are the raw numbers. So we have um, now over almost 400 members um, operating and half of them have responded, which is cool. So 50% have already participated in some way with our efforts. But we also have over 700 people who are using our data in real time that are not members. And a lot of those are NGOs, government officials and things of that nature, which is pretty cool. Um, in terms of how we, we spin up this organization and operate, we are operating on a three kind of level membership status. And what that lets us do is take younger researchers or less experienced personnel and mentor them on our virtual teams. So if they come in at a level one with no experience, we can train them up. Every year we reevaluate and graduate people up based on experience and training. So eventually they'll slide up to level two where they can deploy as a trainee um, in the field under the mentorship of other members. 
At level three, they are equipped to go out without mentorship and even run our working groups. And at level four, they can be on our advisory boards and our steering committee and can lead missions. So this is kind of the way that we're trying to systematically build out our teams so that people's experience um, is rewarded and also encouraged so they can move up in their capacity and be leaders someday. Um, and how we respond to events, everybody wants to know, like, what is the protocol for how we go out? We've changed all that this year as part of our new operating procedure. So I will introduce that today for this brief introduction. At our level one, we don't send anyone to the field. So we actually do a completely virtual response. And that level one response then generates a preliminary virtual reconnaissance report. Every mission in STEER starts that way because we use that virtual data that was gathered through social media and just you know reporting in other agencies data to make the decision whether we level up. In our new level up strategy at level two, we don't send a lot of humans out. Um, based on our experiences, it is better for us to rapidly image the affected area because for structures, if we're not out in about 24 to 48 hours, we're already losing evidence. So we actually send teams out with cars and image the area very quickly and spin out a report that gives recommendations for further study. Once that scouting team comes back, then we can decide whether we level up again. There was a major event. We saw some gaps in our knowledge that deserve in-depth forensic assessment by human beings on the ground with targeted sampling protocols, where they're gonna go after specific buildings in greater detail with some additional technology. And so that kind of lets us be more reasonable about what we commit to and how fast we can move that information out and gives us very recognized products at each exit point from these various levels and greater clarity about our decisions to level up or level down a response, which kind of helps explain how we're spending um, the federal government's money. So if you want to get involved with STEER, come to STEER.network, join. We have a membership button. You can join. We'll assign you to the level based on your experience, help you graduate up, and you'll be added to our Slack channels, Google Drives, and all those good things. So as soon as we go live for an event, you can start participating immediately, as some of the students even on this panel earlier did. So thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, that was so, uh, so great. So much information all at once. Um, I, uh, I guess we'll move on into the questions, um, some of which have already kind of been touched upon. Um, the first one being what, you obviously already answered this a little bit, but what does your EAR or EER uh, association do? And more specifically, why is it important to graduate students? What should graduate students know about your organization? Um, especially if they're interested in getting involved. Is there an order you want us to go in or do you want to call on us? Just let us know. I, I was going to defer to the sort of organic order of inspiration and who feels like they want to contribute first. But again, no, no pressure. If you prefer the structure, I can easily just call people out. Uh, I'm happy to just say, um, we have three three ways. So you know what we do. So I'll just focus on how it helps grad students. Number one, in structures, forensic engineering is rarely taught in any programs. And so unfortunately, you don't learn that. And you learn that through doing and participating. So I think that's one of our first value adds is getting forensic engineering out there to learn from failure. Candidly, in structures does that a lot. It's important to us. Second, I think, and I heard that in the panel earlier, the real world grand challenges, both the human element, and the parts of the built natural environment, they come alive when you do field work. And, and so as a result, I think we just want to ignite in you and inspire in you a commitment to the work and illuminate for you where the gaps are. I think some of the best research comes from that inspiration of seeing what's not working in the field or seeing where you know, our communities need our support, where our environment needs more support, and then being able to answer that call. Field work does that, the data highlights that. So even if you don't go out, the data lets you find those patterns, those opportunities. And the third is like, I love the collaboration networking part. So you guys might know that the National Science Foundation makes us do this statement called conflict of um, COA, affiliation or something like that. Basically tracks all the people you work with so that they're not part of a review of your proposal. I love how long mine is. And it wouldn't be that long if we weren't able to mobilize like 200 people that we never worked with many of them into teams rapidly. And so for a grad student, imagine meeting professors and other students you never would have met before we can spin up a team and give you a world much bigger than your campus and your research group that's really cool and we can do that 
you know, like that now with technology. So that's the parts I like. So I don't have a lot, I mean, a little bit different from Tracy, but really reflecting the exact same things that I would say. And we don't understand the processes in storms during major events, because most of the observations that have been made during coastal storms are during moderate conditions. You deploy instruments in advance and it's not a huge storm. And the processes change when the ocean comes onto land and the land goes out to ocean and you've got pollution going places and the aquifer becoming important. So you really get to understand at the cutting edge, some of these processes and get to make measurements to try and better understand what's happening and understand processes that are really important to communities. There are also, we have made a big effort to network across disciplines. So you'll meet a really broad range of people that are interested in coastal storms across a wide range of disciplines. And as Tracy mentioned, going to the field, getting your hands on, or even doing virtual reconnaissance with a group of people. I think Elliot mentioned this as well. You're gonna to work together analyzing that data for quite a while. You'll get to know each other really well, writing reports in the field, um, doing the virtual reconnaissance, and also really understand the instruments and the processes by doing that work in the field. Okay, so um, certainly Tracy and Britt have covered probably all the salient points, but I'm going to add a couple to it. First of all, to clarify for the grad students here, um, all of these ERs that you see here, and indeed uh, three or four others, we collaborate, we don't compete, and we're all part of an organization called Converge Leadership Corps. So uh, believe it or not, I see Tracy and Britt and, and about four other, five other folks, including Joe Wartman from the Rapid Facility, once a month for a meeting where we discuss things that are going on and how we can uh, and complement each other, how we can support each other. Moving along a little bit to, to you know, why, why might some of these opportunities be important for graduate students? Well, I'll start at, I'll start at one end, and that is, uh, and I can speak for gear here, membership for anybody, including graduate students, is free. And so that's a hell of an organization. And we, we made that commitment 20 years ago that we will not charge you to be a member here. In fact, on the contrary, um, uh, it, it is so important that we engage you that, that we don't ever want there to be barriers like that. The second thing I will say is that um, today, people who are leading gear missions, believe it or not, maybe it was 10 years ago, maybe it was even 20 years ago, were graduate students and they got their first experience traveling as part of a team with their advisor. And today they have, as their career has progressed, they have moved up through exactly that structure that um, uh, Tracy spoke about and they are now the leaders. And what is wonderful for us is that they're not suddenly being thrown into a position of be a leader now without any training. They have actually evolved and developed that along the way. And so it's a very, uh, an absolutely key part of our whole mission that uh, when we send out teams, there are individuals from all levels on the team because we really are trying to, to make sure we're, we're building for the future. The last thing I will add, and maybe this is a good place to add it, but one of the things that we have certainly appreciated and, and recognize all the time. And this is probably almost more when we are involved with international missions is that it's not just about the engineering, if I can call it that, or the science, but it's also about understanding the amazing cultural differences that exist um, country to country. And so if you go over, for example, to uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm generically going to say, if you, if you went to China as part of a, a response and you take your American culture and ideas and bases, you are probably going to do a number of things unintentionally that are quite offensive to the people who live there. So 
one of the important things that we always talk about is this cultural awareness. Understand the community and the environment that you're going into. And that's important not only for your mission that you're particularly on, but I think it's very important for your future career because you come out of it not just as leaders, but as what I would call culturally aware leaders. Absolutely, I think that's a really compelling part as well um, of these facilities and of the whole, I guess, cultural sur culture surrounding the organizations. Um, the next couple of questions I'm going to cluster a little bit, but um, just as an example, what does reconnaissance for each of the EER um, associations, what do they look like? Maybe an example of that process and more specifically, um, how might a graduate student be integrated into those operations? Um, I know, again, we've, we've mentioned it a little bit, but more like kind of an example of how a graduate student could get involved, um, especially at the entry level, someone who's just looking to um, start out. Um, so, I, so, okay, go ahead, Brett, you got it? Go, go ahead, Tracy. Um, yeah, so I mean, I think that in all of our organizations, um, there's an emphasis on, on being mentored or trained, right? So in some instances, um, a responding field member may bring their grad student along, right? That's how the Mayfield um, case study that you saw earlier in the panel came to light. So that is a natural way. But I'll highlight a couple other ways, other than jumping on those virtual teams, which you can do with and without your advisor or with or without a high level of training or experience. Um, grad students research are coming into our network. So we have grad students working on natural language processing. I have a grad student whose work on um, basically mining data from building inventories to pick where we go so we could quickly identify targets and routes to drive for the mission. She's using that. We have students working on damage diagnostics from visuals to process imagery data and try to detect damage levels. So their research is actually driving our operations so that we can make them more efficient. Another thing is we have this data librarian program. It's open to um, um, graduate students and undergraduates, but to learn about post-processing, enriching data, and mining the data for analysis. That's running all year round independent of an event. So your research could literally drive the way we operate and be known to the community as the way STEER you know, detects damage off imagery, all the way down to actually getting your hands in the data and helping to enrich it, even when we're not live responding to an event. Like right now we're quiet watching the hurricanes, right? We're waiting, but there's lots of ways to still get involved even during those down times. Um, so Maybe one last thing to add, uh, at least from my perspective, um, I think you should recognize for many graduate students that it's not a matter of us doing you a favor, um, including you in a team, but in fact, a lot of times you have a skill, a language, a knowledge that is actually critical to us. And uh, I, I just came back from uh, a, a trip to Turkey. I was not doing reconnaissance this time, but I remember when I went after the 1999 Coachelli earthquake, uh, I brought a Turkish graduate student with me. And, and I often joke and say, that was a great example of how she kept me out of trouble. Um, first of all, through being able to communicate but also um, she understood the culture and I don't wanna make this only about culture, but, but she sort of understood things. You also though, do have to be a little bit careful. I remember once we were talking to a group of um, uh, uh, local people in a rural part of Turkey and it was late at night. We'd had one of these long 14 hour days and they invited us to come into their house to have some chai. And so we went in and gradually I noticed more and more people were coming into the house. And at some point in time, it sort of got to be a little bit like sardines in a can. And so I turned to the Turkish graduate student and I said, what's going on here? How come everybody's coming into the house? And her answer was, oh, they heard there was an expert had gone into the house. And 
up until now, and this was four or five days after the earthquake, they had been afraid to go back into their own houses. So they were sleeping outside on the ground in tents. But when they heard that there was an expert was willing to go into the house, um, they felt comfortable going back in as well. And I remember at the time thinking, I hope these people know that this expert is not a structural expert, he's a geotechnical expert. Although I will say, I did check and make sure that I didn't see any major obvious flaws. But the bottom line is, is that there is so much that we learn, for example, from having graduate students with us and, and who, who, who can either speak the language or whatever. So I'm just gonna, Tracy and David basically covered everything that I have to add. We, we really appreciate having graduate students join us and we've had graduate students join all of the teams that NEAR has done to date, um, as well as leveraging the research that you're doing that is beneficial to the measurements we're making and observations we're making, so thank you. Yes, there's, Thanks all around, because I was going to say thank you for uh, for these kind of opportunities to get involved and learn and um, eventually level up, which I think is such a great, such a great um, opportunity. Uh, I'm going to switch gears a little bit so we can move on in some of the questions. Um, the next one is what preparations, um, maybe shedding some light on the on the kinds of preparations that one has to make. Um, if, before a reconnaissance mission and what tools are needed for um, each event. I know, Britt, you mentioned that you can forecast some of the storms, so you're doing a lot of that uh, baseline data collection beforehand. Um, so but we do watch the forecast. We're mm -hmm. constantly watching the weather forecast to see what is expected with different storms and contacting membership to find out if there's interest on um, in deploying. And the interest in that decision is really a question of whether or not we think there's something that is going to happen that we do not currently understand. So perishable data that is going to be lost and new knowledge about what the processes are. As far as preparations, we try to make very sure that Everybody who is interested in deploying in the next near future, next month, has already thought about preparing their instruments. I think Elliot brought some of this up, the importance of making sure you've got the batteries and all the instruments together. Decisions get made really fast to deploy. So we want to make sure that everything is ready to go. So if we do decide to, to deploy, we can get out there quickly. And that also goes for safety gear. We have safety checklists of gear to have ready, making sure you have water on hand so you don't have to run out right as you're deciding to deploy to go and get water and other safety gear. Um, so we try and make sure we've got that ready, you know, more or less at the beginning of hurricane season. We have researchers that study atmospheric rivers on the West Coast and the impacts on the coast. So it might be before atmospheric river season, um, but trying to make sure we're ready to go in advance. Um, and uh, uh, other preparations, I guess, you know, the virtual team then becomes really important starting to think if we do decide to deploy preparations for where we're going to stay, what sites are most important, trolling, looking online, finding out more information, trying to look at the forecast of flooding um, to figure out where we're going to go and where we can go safely and where we can deploy. So the virtual team kicks in early as well before we actually go out into the field. Tracy or David? Um, so I would say that I could um, probably rapidly summarize uh, three areas of preparation that we certainly emphasize strongly. Um, the first one of those is what I would say uh, safety preparation. And for example, we have a safety protocol that's posted on our website. And we, we insist and require that people review that and understand that. 
You know, in the case of, let's say we're responding to an area that's had an earthquake. Well, there's this little thing called an aftershock, which may not be so much of an afterthought, and uh, in fact can put you as in as much danger, if not more than the original event. So we want you to be able to understand immediately you are going into a, a dangerous location. The second area that we certainly uh, emphasize our team members focus on is what I will call ethical reconnaissance. Uh, we have to remember that you are going to an area where people uh, actually were subjected to the event. You probably were not. Um, and we take very much clearly the approach that it is their event and we are there to support them. We are not going there to tell them what to do. Uh, in fact, we tend to take the approach a little bit like Jeopardy on television. It's like, we don't say, here's what you should do. We say, what do you want us to do? We phrase everything in the form of a question. And that is something that I think has served us as an organization very well. And then finally, obviously, there is exactly what, what Britt and, and I'm sure Tracy's going to be talking more about, and I know she already has, but that's the technical preparation. So uh, we, we sort of think of those as three pillars of preparation that are critically important. Now, when a decision has been made by the gear steering committee to deploy to a location, one of the early things we do is we identify a team leader, or in the case of a larger event, uh, a, 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 a leader and a co-leader. And then since they are going to be the ones leading the team in the field, we really give a huge amount of the authority and the responsibility for them to coordinate, to make sure they have the right people on the team that they want, to make sure that we that they, they are thinking about the, the equipment and so on. We obviously are, are underwriting the costs of all of those sort of things, but we, we try and shift that responsibility for the planning as quickly as we can to that team team leader or leaders, because ultimately they're going to be the ones in the field coordinating. And, and our role changes from being sort of the original decision makers to a supporting role. What can we do in turn for the team leaders and their team? Yeah, and so I guess I'll just um, bring it full circle just to focus on the hardware in case you're interested about what kind of equipment goes out. Um, so we, so the way we do our teams is we have a pre-deployment briefing. You'll see that in all of our um, data sets if you ever want to read it and see what we we assembled. That identifies all the targets and it has linked GIS maps with all of our assets that we are deploying. Um, like in Britt's case, if we know that there's um, towers out that we're measuring the wind fields or there are gauges, we're going to map all that because if we can do structural observations in close conjunction to those, we're going to be able to link loads and performance. So. We optimize all those routes and identify those targets. And that's all communicated in this briefing with hyperlinks. And it's preloaded into the phones of all of our investigators. Um, then, you know, beyond PPE and safety, David hit that point very importantly. The prime equipment at our level two is their Fulcrum mobile app. So we're on Fulcrum app. Any of you can get access to all of our data there. And so they just need a smartphone and any kind of personal measurement devices, and then they can deploy. In level one, we are using those panoramic um, imaging technologies to do like essentially street view, but we've done them on boats, on backpacks, on drones, and on cars, um, depending on the terrain. So a lot of that's being imaged that way. And then again, using the drones to get up overhead to do all the rapid imaging. And when we're out in that second level where we're doing the in-depth forensics, we might take samples and collect them to bring back to test in the lab. Um, but we'll also sometimes deploy LIDAR at that point and generate point clouds um, to richly recreate sites or structures that we want to do in-depth case study on. So between mobile apps and smartphones, panoramic imaging, your UAS drone systems, and then LIDAR select use of LIDAR, that's kind of the equipment portfolio that we're deploying when we go out. Okay, yeah, thank you. Um, very interesting. Um, I guess that brings us to the next question of uh, how, what are some of the most important things, areas, uh, points of interest that post-disaster reconnaissance team target to survey and collect. Oftentimes, um, I think a few of the presentations mentioned, you're studying a huge study area and there has to be some sort of prioritization surrounding what data you can collect at what time, you know, prioritizing when and how to collect that data, I guess. Is there any insight into how you 
your organizations choose to target those areas? So structures are a little weird because we're not, um, we are a bunch of individual things in, in, in inventories, right? So we do representative sampling um, for our first wave. So we're gonna try to go through and generate a statistical sample that represents, so let's say in this community that was impacted, there's a certain percentage of schools, medical facilities, critical facilities, residential, commercial. We'll try to pick routes and clusters that would give us a sampling of how all those were doing. The second thing we'll do in the, in the design is we'll try to move along the hazard gradient so we can see how those are performing at different levels of intensity. So we might drive along the tornado track or we might flare out from the landfall region along you know, to either side or you follow the transect of the storm surge inland. So that'll be a second um, way that we're doing it. And then when we're going back for those more in-depth case studies, then that's a lot more interesting because at that point, that original data might've told you schools were underperforming or we might be sampling based on year of construction tied to different editions of the code. So we'll see that, okay, everything post 2015 had a problem before they released the new code in 2018. So we're gonna go after that year of construction using GIS to find those buildings. And if we see that vulnerability, we'll go back then and do in-depth forensics to figure out what went wrong to make those um, you know, so problematic. Or if we know that there's buildings that are close to a strong motion station. So in Haiti, there was one station that was working to get the, the records of that earthquake in 2021 of August. So we got every structure within a radius of that so that we could map the intensity and the performance of every building. So sometimes you are going back and, and tailoring the mission to take advantage of um, you know, concurrent measurements of the hazard and then kind of adjusting your sampling strategy. But otherwise we're doing a randomized sample so that we're not biasing core damage. Otherwise you wouldn't understand performance. You'd think everything was broken if every picture was a destroyed building. So we try to do representative sampling. So near is a little bit different too, because we focus on the pre-event deployment and the location where we're gonna deploy prior to an event is dictated by what the forecasts are, where we think there's going to be um, significant impact of the storm. It's also though dictated by where we can get permissions. So we've actually been working with others to get permissions in advance along certain areas of the coast, as many as we can, and we're hoping to expand that over the years. But that means we can get to those locations quickly. We know what the site's like. We know we, where we can deploy. We know if there are structures there and we can deploy in front or behind. So having some contrasting locations. So there's a lot that goes into deciding where we do the pre-event deployment and site characterization, um, trying to get some different types of sites. Post-event, we're going to want to revisit those sites no matter what. And then also look at contrasting areas. So if we got a lot of erosion or accretion at the site we chose, we might want to survey places nearby that didn't have that. Or if we chose an embayment, we might want to survey someplace nearby that didn't. But we also will try and focus on some areas maybe we didn't catch the heaviest impact. So looking at other areas where there was more impact and trying to look at a large enough area that we see what got impacted and what got scoured, for instance, or eroded or treated or flooded or pollution and what didn't. So trying to get contrast, um, I'd say, but we are somewhat tied in by where we decide to deploy pre-event as well. So, you, you know, in some sense, very similar to, to aspects of both what Tracy and, and Britt have said, but I, I, maybe I can describe how gear kind of use it just slightly differently. We tend to take what I call a sort of a multi-platform approach um, and again, some of this depends a little bit on, on the size or the extent of an event. Uh, but um, where possible, if we can get uh, several sets of eyes up in either a helicopter or a fixed wing aircraft uh, early on to do a very uh, extensive um, uh, overview. You're obviously, you, yeah, you may snap a few photos out the window of the helicopter, or whatever, but you're not making detailed measurements. But what we're trying to do is to get a sense of that overall picture of the damage. Uh, now, over the last 10 years, uh, a, a new platform that has obviously emerged in there that's maybe not quite as 
extensive as, as, as a, a, an aircraft with a human on it are drones. So now we can start to, 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 to come to that level. And then we, we obviously will have people on the ground traveling to certain areas. And we, we're, we're starting to be in a position then to, to be more targeted. And then finally, you know, a lot of times if we're going to, if we're going to be doing, let's say for example, and, and we do just almost in every response now, LIDAR measurements or something, we will, we will prioritize specific locations and, and that, that we think are going to allow us to gain the most information. And, and so we tend to, to, to do this sort of what I would call multi-platform phased approach where we start big and work our ways down then to the specific case histories as needed. Thank you. Yeah, I, it's kind of interesting to see that also, of course, by virtue of the different kinds of events uh, that you're trying to capture, but to see the variation in the organizations, which is all the more all the better for the interdisciplinary or interorganizational collaborations to really get the full scope, especially when you're looking at multi-hazard sites. I know, for example, with earthquakes and tsunamigenic earthquakes, there's a lot of intersecting hazards, which can, can lead very quickly to a disaster if there's like the slightest failure in, in um, infrastructure that, or say in communication and in early warning systems. Uh, so it's really interesting to see how how that might actually work in action. Um, so the next question is, um, what are the benefits? I know a lot of us may already understand the benefits, um, but just to lay it out uh, very neatly, what are the benefits of post-disaster reconnaissance and how does this information get communicated, I guess, more specifically to improve, um, improve say structures or planning? Um, yeah, so I'll leave I'm, it there. I'm going to give an example of one result that I think Jasmine knows about, um, work that Naveed and his team did before and after Hurricanes Laura and Delta. And that was in 2020, and Hurricane Laura impacted, well, Hurricane Delta, I should say, impacted the same area of Louisiana as Hurricane Laura. So, um, the teams went out, they deployed instruments, did site characterization and deployed instruments before the hurricanes uh, made landfall, after Hurricane Laura, and then again after Hurricane Ida. And in the area where they deployed, there was a breakwater that had been partially built. So one transect of instruments was behind a breakwater. The other transect was not. And they were able to compare those two transects. Breakwaters are typically thought to help protect the coast. That's why they're building them. One of the things they found though is that the breakwater also hindered the receding water. So the area behind the breakwater stayed flooded quite a bit longer. So that gives us a lot of information about how these structures will react. The breakwaters do tend to protect the coast when there's moderate waves. In this case, the wave energy, the erosion accretion was no different on the two transects. They were completely inundated and the breakwater had little effect when the storm was coming in, but it really affected the receding waters when the storm was going out. And that's something that will be really important for coastal engineers and coastal managers to know when they're thinking about putting breakwaters along their coast. So just one example. That's a really good example. Go for it, David. So I was going to say that I think, and maybe a little bit at a high level, but when we go to the field and we're conducting our reconnaissance and we're very much focused on, as I said before, perishable data, uh, we're focused on facts. We're not at that stage trying to explicitly understand what happened. It's a challenging environment to be working in. You're working long days you need to gather as much high fidelity data as you can and not get yourself completely mired in trying to understand every bit of data at the time. Uh, the reason also though that we do that is that we see a number of um, paths by which perishable data that we have collected um, uh, catalyzes subsequent activities. Some of it may be research, 
Um, and so additional funding from NSF to investigators uh, through whether it's a regular, a, a rapid or an additional uh, regular grant, uh, that catalyzes research and, and that advances our overall knowledge of, of uh, performance and problems and, and possible solutions. We also at the same time are always thinking about what are the implications for what we're observing on practice? Um, so it's not a matter of just saying, well, we're just researchers, so I'm not going to worry about it. No, we have to think about what happens in practice and how can things that we observe and, and share with, with, with practice. In fact, we often have practitioners on our teams for that very reason, to keep that a short circuit to them. And then finally, the other part of it, and sometimes this takes a little bit longer or is a little bit more heavy lifting, but if we can impact policy, then that becomes critically important. Um, uh, and, and you know, uh, this is not to pick on any politician anywhere, but um, at times they have a shorter attention span. And we often say that, you know, in the United States, we need a decent earthquake every 20 years, or maybe it's even less. So we remind politicians that we have not solved the problem. We need to still um, uh, do research to inform practice, to inform policy. And, and if, if an earthquake hasn't happened for quite a time or another disaster for that matter, I'm not just focusing on earthquake, then it, it becomes uh, a little less um, in their field of view or on their radar. So uh, bottom line is, is we see ourselves only as the first step of a whole set of paths. They may be some parts, sometimes they may be sequential, sometimes they may be happening in parallel, but I would describe it as, as, as research practice and policy. So um, I guess, uh, I don't know who's going to the NERI summit, but at the NERI summit, you will actually hear vignettes of where reconnaissance made this, this impact. So I'm gonna summarize the ones you'll, you'll hear about or some of them. Uh, the first is you will hear about um, how we validate codes and standards and update those standards. So in Hurricane Michael, Panhandle got hammered and there was a big revelation about some of the deficiencies that within three years of the hurricane updated ASC-7 based on reconnaissance findings. Um, the Oso landslide, that was a gear mission, um, took seven years for that reform, but led to the, this landslide reduction act that created a three depth program that's even imaging our entire country and creating 3D elevation models that we're using for all hazards now, wind storms, wildfire, everything to create um, simulation tools. Um, the data sets we're using, they calibrate all the computational models of things like the Sim Center. Um, so as a result, like all the data that we collect after Hurricane Laura calibrated those models and even trained machine learning algorithms to help us forecast losses more accurately. So that's work that the Sim Center is doing that used um, Hurricane Laura data that we collected. Um, the Mayfield tornado case study you had earlier, right? An example where recon spurred additional follow-up research after seeing something interesting that hadn't been studied before. And that leads to additional funding. So you can go get more money built on what you discover in recon. And then validation of construction practices. Um, and for me, like, you know, the response again to that Haiti earthquake in 2021 um, we're now advising the World Bank on how to reconstruct that nation based on the data collected off smartphones by Haitians, actually, and assessed by steer engineers remotely. And the USGS's pager is being recalibrated for developing nations because it sometimes um, over predicts losses because of a failure of being able to document how that kind of construction performs since it's informal. So here's where our data actually is updating tools that we all rely on, things like pager and guidance given to reconstruction um, in an island like Haiti with a lot of challenges. No, definitely. Um, thank you for all of these answers. We're, we're running low on time, so I'm going to skip, skip through a little bit, uh, combine some questions. Um, but the next question is, how long does the post-disaster reconnaissance generally take, uh, including data processing and reporting? And I guess as a, as a prequel to that question, um, how, if you have an area which you do not have baseline data for ahead of time, how do you rectify that situation um, and kind of ensure that doesn't happen in the future? Uh, really, I'm just throwing throwing questions out there. If any of these inspire you, feel free to answer them. 
Well, Nier is the cool kids because they baseline. So I love the fact that Nier does that. Um, I can't do that for all hazards. Um, hurricanes, yeah, but our tornadoes, earthquakes, tsunamis, not. Nah. So we do a lot of use of machine learning and computer vision to mine from Google Street View and existing aerials and reconstruct the digital city as best we could pre-event. So that's how we kind of handle that. Your question about timing, I think that was the other part. Um, our preliminary report from the virtual team comes out in about a week. The field data collection for us is often about two up to four weeks, and then they issue that report. Data set can take a long time. So our biggest data sets, again, can be thousands of buildings that are quality controlled and enriched. That can take months. So sometimes that data, um, the data QC, we do a lot of quality control in our data before we release it um, because people are calibrating models to that data. So we can hold that for months. Even the bigger missions have been um, a year before somebody has actually enriched all that data and quality controlled it where we feel confident releasing it. Knowing that that's really hard in the community, we make all our data available in real time, but it has a quality control tag, like this has not been checked. And so you get to see it graduate up to um, approved levels for use, but you could still look at it at day zero and see it, even though we can't assure that it's all accurate yet. Well, I'll, I'll just echo what, what uh, um, uh, Tracy said. And the one thing I will also say though, and this, this may be interest to a number of graduate students, I would say that an active area of research right now is specifically focused on how can we accelerate the processing of some of these data sets. And part of the part of, of what we're, I think the solutions exist, for example, is you don't have to process everything at once and then release the final product. If, for example, though, that you can decimate the data, and I, by decimating, I don't mean destroy it. I mean, take every 10th data point and process that. You'll get a pretty damn good answer. It'll be a little better, but you will dramatically reduce, for example, the processing time if you do things like that. And at the same token, right now, it's a very active of, of area of, of research opportunity. So as you're trying to think about research projects or what an angle you might take to put into your project, think about, is there an approach that you could integrate and develop that can, in fact, reduce that time of, for processing the data? You know, quite often, the collection of the data is only a small piece of the story, a bit like Elliot's iceberg, and the processing is the big piece that's below water. <laughs> If we can make that piece below the water uh, smaller, I think we're going to be in great shape. I would just echo what David and Tracy said. And um, we try and get, Near tries to get a preliminary data report out within a month of the event that's got most of the virtual data in it. So we try and get the virtual data out right away, some of the site characterization out right away, right away not being quite as fast as STEER does. Um, but we try and get it out relatively quickly with a lot of contact information. So people can collect, can contact the individuals that deployed sensors, but processing, excuse me. Sorry, background noise, processing the, uh, instrument data can certainly take a lot of time and the quality control is difficult and you have to look at what was going on and it takes a lot of thought sometimes to understand these instruments do get lost sometimes they get displaced they get lost they get buried they get eroded they get accreted um so there's there's some thought that goes into that but uh the data is still really valuable when it gets done Awesome, thank you. I think we have time for maybe one more question um, quickly. Um, and something that I think a lot of us think about a lot is the how, what metrics are used to validate data sets or what metrics are used to evaluate um, the post-disaster reconnaissance data quality and what are the challenges in that? Um, So I, maybe I can jump in. So first of all, um, uh, making sure that instruments are calibrated before you go to the field, um, things like that are the obvious uh, that, that help in part with it. But there are lots of little things that you can also do in the field. And, and for example, 
some devices now have an integral uh, GPS embedded into them. But uh, uh, something that I have historically done is if I have a handheld GPS at various times during the day or even a couple of times a day, I will take a picture with my camera of my handheld GPS. And what's important is that there's a timestamp on the camera, there's a timestamp on the GPS, and there's a left long on the GPS. And so I know that at least at that point in time, uh, I was exactly where I was at whatever exactly time it was. I'm not going to learn any en engineering information from that, but it's a little redundant trick that you can do as one example. And there are many others like that, that I think go a long way. Another thing to do is, is um, a, a little redundancy on measurements. If, if there's some important things, have two people take the same picture or do, do similar things. And so now you've got redundant data sets that you can go back and make sure that they're supporting each other. Right. Agreed with That's David right. and um, mentioned, the students mentioned this too, take notes. You can never have too many notes. Take lots and lots of notes of what you're seeing, what you're doing, um, where uh, you saw different features, measurements. If you can measure instruments in different ways, measure how deeply it was buried to begin with, how deeply it was buried at the end, um, water marks, knowing roughly how deep the water was um, when you're making measurements of water levels or how deep it got. The more who did what, who made what measurements is really important as well. So you can go back and contact them and say, you know, do you remember what you saw when this happened or what notes they have? So I notes and more notes and more notes. Um, I'll just come in and I think notes segues into what I'm going to say. We were big on and we, we harp, have standards, have protocols and stick to them. And so we created standards for not only how you capture the data, but then how you quality control it and how you curate it. And it's always consistent. It makes it easier for people to discover your research and your data and, and reuse it. Um, and it creates, again, consistency, which is what we need in the community. Um, when your hardware, the different platforms we use, they often have an output of accuracy and resolution. We document the accuracy and resolution in our data report so people know the settings that were used and the precision. But then we publish the metadata with the output so you know, like especially for the GPS enabled ones, what the resolution was. Um, we also have this, as I said, this quality control process where data librarians review uh, the building records and, and conduct these quality control checks. But then we have a randomized audit where someone comes in and randomly samples records. And if they flag that we see too many deviating, we'll reinitiate the QC. And then the last thing that we're doing that I really like is damage rating by structural engineers at a global level. So like looking at a building and saying severe damage versus moderate, that's highly subjective. So what we've started to do now is we're actually rating the percentage of damage to individual components. That's easier for me to say 50% of the windows were lost on the side of the building. And then we're building transfer functions that map that to global damage ratings that are established so that we don't have to pick one rating. We can have every rating system out there from the one the Japanese use to the one that somebody uses from LSU to the one that the um, wind engineers from Texas use. And as long as we can break those component performance scores down, which are again, more um, subject, um, objective, then we can map them to the more subjective skills using transfer functions. And we think that's gonna improve consistency of damage ratings. Two other very quick points just before I know we'll wrap up. Um, and, and I think somebody already mentioned this, but don't forget to take or to document successful structures or successful features, because otherwise there's a tendency that when you get back to the, your office, the assumption is that um, everything failed or, or whatever. And so that's, yeah. it's important that you keep that in mind. The, um, the other thing is that uh, keep, also keep in mind that when you stand somewhere with a camera and take a picture, even if it's a nice camera and it's got a GPS built in, it's recording where you are, not what you're taking the picture of. And so it may be, it may be accurate to within plus or minus two meters 
of where you are, but if the feature you're taking the picture of is 100 meters away, you're actually 98 meters off. And nowadays there are emerging cameras that not only um, record where you are, but they record an azimuth. And in fact, they even have a distance, a laser distance uh, measurement off of it. And so technology is helping us improve the quality of the data that we're gathering. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, that's all great answers to the questions. And if anyone has any further questions, you can find the contact info for each of those events in the chat. I'm sorry, each of those organizations in the chat. Um, and thank you so much to our experts uh, for this amazing um, presentation. We have a quick, we had a quick five minutes to talk about the rad, Rapid Graduate Scholars Program in, introduction. That five minutes has come and gone, but J Joseph, do you still have a little bit of time? Uh, I do, and I will, um, oh, I'll sorry. condense that five minutes down into 30 seconds, which is, uh, I'm just going to throw up this slide. I also put a link into the chat, but I just wanted to bring your attention to the Graduate Student Scholars Program that the Rapid facility has. Um, our goal is to expand the pool of individuals such as yourself. And the reason we want to do this is because of the three presentations we saw at the beginning of the workshop today. They were extraordinary. And, and I, I compliment all of, the, uh, all of the presenters, but also the way that they're really pushing the limits on the use of rapid instrumentation. And so we love to see that, and we'd like to see more of that and to help facilitate that. We have a program by which you can apply uh, for competitive grants to access the rapid facility instrumentation to further your graduate level research. And um, again, I'll, I'll keep this short and just say that follow the links online. Um, we made three awards this year for a coastal engineering project, a project in Norway that has a geotechnical basis, and then also a project looking at um, erosion of dams and the interaction with vegetation. So three really interesting projects this year. It will run again next year from this, well, this year from December 1st through January will be the, the period when the applications are open. And uh, you can uh, just stay tuned to Design Safe for announcements on the program. Thank you. Thank you, Joseph, and apologies again for the tardiness, but you can find the link to the, um, the program in the chat as well as in, um, on the designsafe.org kind of umbrella. Thank you again to everybody who presented and uh, discussed and attended. Um, I learned a lot and I'm really grateful to have been able to, to be here. So thank you.